I'm delighted to be talking today with Gary Johns. Gary Johns was elected to the Federal Parliament as the member for Petrie and held it for the Labor Party from 1987 to 1996. During that time, he served as the Special Minister of State and Assistant Minister for Industrial Relations from 93 to 96 in the Keating government. He also served as an Associate Commissioner of the Commonwealth Productivity Commission from 2002 to 2004. Gary has a PhD in political science from UQ, a master's in geography, and a bachelor's in economics from Monash University. Gary Johns is a regular columnist for the Australian newspaper and author of many books. He joins me today to talk about his new book, Your Body Belongs to the Nation. Thanks so much for joining us today, Gary. Pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Now, I'm really fascinated and have to go straight to the most pressing question I want to talk about because it might take a whole episode. Tell me about your journey from left to right or classical liberal, if you prefer. Why don't you even start off by describing your current political philosophy and then okay. the journey? Um, I've spent long enough in government to realise that government doesn't have all the answers and probably has few answers. So you start with a proposition, you're a good labour boy, you grew up in a labour family, there's no debate in the family, we just, you just labour. Mm-hmm. You know, dad's a house painter and mum's working at the sink. Uh, and I attend Monash University in the early 1970s, a very radical campus. So you're just innately leftist. Mm-hmm. But within very few years, you realise after you've read your Marx, Hegel and Marcuse and all the rest of them, that this is complete nonsense. People do not live their lives as the left would have us live it. Right. So then I started to read uh, the editorials in the Financial Review, which which is, you know, you really shouldn't do that if you're a Labor person. (laughs) (laughs) And it's it's starting to make sense to me. I think, okay, there's a bigger world out there. There's an economy. Um, We've got a lot of people who work very hard for themselves, but in doing so make a stronger economy that does pour money into government, which then tries to help people who can't help themselves. So, so your perspective begins to shift. So by, by 1980, really, I, I would call myself a, an economically rational Labor person. And fortunately, we had in the development of the Hawke and Keating governments, uh, a, a corpus of Labor people who were, who were pretty rational people. Now, I think that's all gone. That was just a moment in time. Mm-hmm. And I've continued my my journey. Um, I'm, I'm a centre-right person, uh, fairly, very liberal in my views, but I don't underestimate the fact that we've built an economy and a welfare state. And you can't just wish it away. Yeah. You have to work with it and see if it can do as much good as we can get out of it and as little harm as we can hope for. I think that's probably describing um, the true disposition of conservatism. And it's like, let's take the best of what we've got and move forward with it while trying to improve the things that aren't worth carrying forward. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, it's, it's pragmatic, but with, a, with I think, a, a fairly strong philosophical basis that is um, you know, a nation full of bad people is not going to be a very good nation so individuals right. really do count mm. um, fortunately we've inherited wonderful institutions uh, from the from the UK um, Parliament and common law and most of our statute base and so on and so forth wonderful courts now mm. um, and uh, a great sense of humor uh, which enables us to have, well, until recently, I think, yeah, that's right. we used to get through uh, a lot of difficult debates in the public sphere in Australia with a lot of humour. Mm. You could sort of say, OK, I know your views are X, mine are Y, but come on, we'll go down the pub and we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. Yeah. Now it appears as though you can't even have certain conversations because some people have become so uptight. Especially at the pub. Especially if your brand is Coopers. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Coopers thing was was a sad episode. Uh, if people don't 
recall this, this is uh, the South Australian Brewing Company had, uh, I think, supported the Bible Society, what, for 100 years? I think it was nearly 200. Was it? Oh, well, the Bible Society's been around for... Yeah, yeah, but Cooper's hasn't been. It was a huge... No, no, Cooper's hasn't been. For a long time. Been, but and then... It, it, uh, it was a big anniversary the for The Bible Society uh, hosted a really intelligent, genteel debate between two uh, Liberals uh, in the Federal Parliament. Uh, making one, exactly the point that you were making. Let's talk about let's it. Let's talk we about it. We disagree. Uh, they had a, you know, product placement, a couple of Coopers there, yeah. which I don't drink. Yeah. I don't drink. I, I like other beers. And um, here they were. Uh, one was in favour of gay marriage, the other against. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. And then we had this horrible sort of firestorm mm. from those who said, you can't have this debate because it promotes an anti-gay marriage position. It didn't. Now, the, the sad thing was that that Cooper's the family, you know, and I, I do know the woman who runs uh, the, the, the family trust, absolutely collapsed in the face mm. of this sort of online firestorm. It would have been over in two days. So a couple of pubs weren't going to buy your beer. Who cares? Yep. Instead, there was this sort of uh, pathetic <laughs> apology online about, oh, we're terribly sorry if we've offended anyone. Mm. That company spat in the face of free speech. Mm. There's a much bigger thing at play than gay marriage. They spat in the face of free speech. Now, that was a, a, a sort of a, a signature moment in, a, in Australian political life, and Cooper's failed. They failed the mm. test. Um, so th there you go. Things have changed somewhat. We have to be very careful that we remain open in our debate and discussion because ultimately that's, mm. that's what keeps a good But democracy. you're absolutely right. It, it's so much easier if it's lubricated by an Australian sense of humour. Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, the, the cartoon with an Aboriginal policeman, an Aboriginal deadbeat dad and an Aboriginal kid... Yeah. Instead of instead of seeing the issue scrutinised through humour, our reflexes become outrage, yeah. and it's it's to the detriment of the debate. Yeah, I think so. Uh, there was a Bill Leak cartoon published mm. in the Australian, and, and Bill, it, it was brilliantly accurate. It it displayed the truth that. Um, Many Aboriginal children born, especially in remote communities, do not have a father. <laughs> there mm. isn't one around. Mm. Um, if I can pull some figures off the top of my head, I think it's like uh, of Aboriginal mothers. Um, it, it's something like, now, now there's an enormously high percentage of Aboriginal mothers where there is, where the father is unknown. It's extraordinarily high. Not just absent, but unknown. Unknown. Wow. Um, and I mean, that's just sad. And, and Bill was just making the point. He, it wasn't a point about race. Mm. It may have been about culture, but culture is the way we live, the rules by which we live. Mm. Now, the rules by which Aboriginal people live, especially in remote communities, are often foul, awful rules. Um, when, that's another debate. We may not get there today. Mm. But the fact that is, is, you, that should, is a whole episode. you should be able to observe how people live and make comment. Uh, and you can make uh, uh, the comment with great empathy. Yeah. But you're entitled to make the comment. Yep. You've got to say, hang on, there are 20,000 children a year being born out here uh, mm -hmm. who will die young. They will be very ill. And there's no amount of white man's money we can throw at this that will solve it because they'll be born into positions where no one has ever worked. Yeah. And so on and so forth. It's a, yeah. it's a long debate. But yeah, and you know, for, for this, the man's pilloried. <laughs> Uh, so, is it fair to say that you left the left, mm. but the left also left you? Uh, 
the 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 rational type of people that were once your peers in the Labor Party, their type of person is no longer in the Labor Party. Uh, I think that's broadly true. Um, I can't go too far because I don't talk to the Labor Party much anymore. Oh, I think we, we broke up some years ago, <laughs> about the turn of the century. In fact, I didn't wake up. They were still taking money out for the annual dues and I didn't realise. You know, I think my wife probably checked the, <laughs> checked the bank statement one day and said, what's this? Oh, right. and, we, and we ceased at that point. But, yeah, that's nearly 20 years ago. So there certainly wasn't a moment where you... Resigned in protest? Not at all. No, no. When I was a member of uh, there was caucus, no demonstration. I was very, uh, I was, I was very disciplined. Right. So if I, uh, t uh, and there were a couple of times when I argued against the party's position in the caucus room. That's where the members of the parliamentary Labor Party meet. Mm. I lost, and I went into Parliament and voted with the majority. That's not only the way it is, it's the way it should be. If you want to form a government in a big party, and I tell you, uh, nation states need bigger parties because a, a lot of the grist and awful business of politics takes place in the party okay. where you can do the deals and then proper, good proper deals, yep. crunch the numbers and then put it into the parliament. Yeah. Honestly, you really need that. It's actually less expensive than the alternative, mm. which is buying off hundreds of individual members of parliament. And I don't mean buying off in the sense of bribing, but you know, you want something for your electorate, you want something for your electorate, oh, terrific. Yeah. You know? yeah. it, all you do is spend all the money on things that are un unimportant. Mm. Anyway, so the big parties do great work, but if you want to be in a big party, having had your say, and the votes being taken, you then maintain the discipline. Now, but once I'd left the parliament, um, the party didn't own me and I could be free to express my views. Now, they were very angry at a lot of my views and I'd get nasty little notes from former members and I'd just say, but I'm a citizen. I'm, I'm ent as entitled as anyone else to have my say. Yeah. Um, no one bothers to have a shot at me anymore from the party because they've given up on me. Um, I do have a lot of new friends on the other side, but I say to them, I'm not one of you. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a national. I just have my, my view. It's what I always wanted to do in politics since the age of 16, 17, which was to, uh, to have my say, not I'm sure there's ego involved, but not in an egotistical way. I want to I have certain insights and, and I want to express them and, mm. I, and I want the country to, to operate well uh, for the greatest number of people. So it's pretty utilitarian. And now after, mm, you know, 40 something years, I feel as though I, I, I have some experience and insights. Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to keep uh, sort of... Uh, keep keep having having my say, um, and I get some lovely feedback from my columns in the Australian and the, and the Spectator and books and so on and so forth, uh, which I, I really appreciate. And, and uh, uh, it's a bit of a thrill to sort of be in the public arena. Uh, you do cop uh, some criticism from time to time, but that's that's okay. That, that's that's good. The thing I like about your columns, and I think the thing I even like about the way you describe your cohort of of Labor colleagues um, in the Keating government, is that rationalism prevails. It's not about identity politics, or or if it is, it's it's untasteful to you. Um, that what we're actually after is the truth. And whatever our perspective in approaching it isn't as relevant as the destination. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, let's, uh, you know, go back to 1960. Um, not all Aborigines had the vote. M most did, but, but in certain places they didn't. Uh, women were not accepted, by and large, as part of the workforce. Uh, homosexuals were unseen and there were terrible laws against their actions. Mm. Uh, we, we were still pretty much a white society. Move forward to today 
sorry, I mean, it's all over. <laughs> we, we have, uh, Aboriginal people have moved into our society in big numbers. Thank goodness. Mm. And we've just got a small group locked away out of the economy in remote areas, and that's, that's a tragedy. Uh, women are into it, gays are into it, uh, people of all ethnicities, colours. Uh, we're so over it in a nice way. Mm. People are now getting on with it. And yet, there are those people, mainly in universities and certain public sector jobs, who have risen on the back of the really good freedom fighters in the Aboriginal community, gay community, women's movements, etc., etc., who now want to maintain their so-called status by pressing identity politics. And, and this is all it is. In, fa in fact, identity politics is, is, is the end of the freedom fight. And it's these characters who lead the Aboriginal industry, gay industry, uh, women's industry, um, you know, certain ethnic leaders and so on and so forth, who in fact need to corral their followers in order to keep they, the leaders, in and around committees of parliament, dining with prime ministers, receiving mm -hmm. public funds and all the rest of it. When objectively we can say, sorry, it's, it's pretty much over. There isn't, there's some prejudice out there, but not a lot. We've achieved that equality of opportunity now. Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, my, my... the only thing left to fight for and be outraged about yeah. is a lack of equality of outcome. Yeah as opposed to the equality of opportunity. We'll never have equality of outcome. Which is a fairy tale. There's no such thing. No, no, there won't. When, when the, the moment a child is born, you know, two twin brothers or daughters, there will be a different outcome. That's right. No matter how much love, attention and public funds we pour onto yeah. the twins, yep. uh, their lives will be very different. Well, look, I'm keen to talk about your new yes. book, Your Body Belongs to the Nation. You've brought all your books in. Yes. Um, in the next segment, let's talk about the role of government, what it's meant for and what it's not meant for, and then we can start narrowing in on as that relates to health. Look forward to it. Thanks for watching. If you really enjoyed that video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Have a look at this great video next and check out the website for even more interesting articles and episodes later.